Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we are talking about anxiety, specifically um, Elka Scholz's book, Anxiety Warrior. And so we're on part two. Part one, we talked about um, what anxiety is and is not, and how you can tell if you actually are feeling anxiety, which is so important to just be aware of whether you're anxious or not. And then we also talked about a whole bunch of strategies that you can do. And we use the example of social phobia. And we went through all the different scenarios that I could think of in my head <laughs> and like ways of handling that. Um, what we didn't do is answer I didn't give you the opportunity to answer the first question that I asked, which is all the different types of anxiety. So there's um, panic disorder. So I have a whole bunch of them. So can I list them out and you can give me kind of a quick, quick brief of what those Absolutely. are? Absolutely, yep. Yeah. So panic disorder. Yeah, so uh, panic disorder, uh, what that is, is just this um, emanating feeling of panic all the time. So heart rate tends to be quicker. Um, it can sometimes be triggered or not triggered. It could just come on. Um, and a lot of the panic, uh, it could be excessive sweating. So what it means is that um, it's a very debilitating type of anxiety uh, disorder and the sensations are much more intense. So quite unpleasant. Um, and at any time, uh, some of these, if you have difficulties uh, breathing or you're feeling heart pain or lightheaded or dizzy, definitely go see your doctor or get medical attention and let them make sure that it is just a panic disorder. And, mm. um, you know, if this is happening often, uh, then you do want to um, uh, get some uh, help with that, some coaching or therapy for sure. Okay, I think I have this. So let's okay. go down. I want to actually explore this slightly and I promise it won't be the same level, but so I actually have a low level anxiety. I have no idea what the anxiety is, but I know it, it manifests in heart pains and my um, breathing feeling like I can never take a full breath. So, but I don't, there's no conscious understanding. There's not like, oh, it's related to X, Y, Z. And when I tune into the checklist, there's not, all I'm getting is you're going through transition. That's all I get. You know, you're going through the anxiety of going into the unknown and panicking around what the unknown is. So how does one deal with this? And I assume that I'm, I'm mentioning this also because I think a lot of people in COVID are having this kind of panic disorder because, oh, I got the vaccine. Well, there's a variant, you know, you're like, oh, you know, like, yeah, I know it, it's endless. So um, well, one of the things that we were going to talk about, and I can I can uh, skip into this because it is important, and it is part of this checklist again. And um, so here's here you're describing a, an interesting uh, situation, and probably like you said, one that we're all experiencing. So, um, so going back to that scale, that zero to ten, let's just say that, um, you know, I woke up and right away I was a six or a seven. So feeling really, really unpleasant. So then I start going, okay, I better have a sip of water. Maybe my anxiety, my brain is giving my anxiety um, signals. Now here's something very interesting. So let's say you don't know what the cause is. Let's say you start going through, you go, no, there's nothing really on my plate. Yeah, stuff's happening out in the world, but right now, you know, life is good. I've got money in the bank. My house is good. Everything is good. Why have I got this, this overwhelming feeling of anxiety? Well, it can come from um, uh, substances. So uh, perhaps uh, you have a sensitivity to uh, mm. certain foods. Perhaps mm. you've got a sensitivity to caffeine or alcohol. I mean, um, some people have, and I, I come back to my private practice is some clients have discovered that, you know, that alcohol for them creates anxiety the next day. So it, again, oh. it's just knowing where you're at. And, and here's another thing is hormones can oh. create anxiety. Uh, an iron deficiency can create oh. uh, depression like symptoms. 
And um, so it's really interesting to when you're doing your checklist and if there's this big mystery and and kind of I work like a detective, like there's a Mm. mystery. Why am I at this heightened anxiety? So if you can think about it as what what is it that I've got to discover? Not so much what's wrong with me. So anxiety is Mm. there for a reason. It's, it's just mysterious right now. We just don't know why, but it is there for reason. So let's discover it. The other thing is uh, thyroid. Um, if you have, and I'm not saying everybody has the thyroid condition. It's not about that, but let's rule out all the possibilities. Thyroid can also give you anxiety type symptoms. And um, do you want to rule that out? I always ask uh, again, clients if they've had a recent blood test Um, Mm -hmm. and a lot of people have they have regular checkups um, but if they haven't you really want to rule out um, some of these things Uh, cigarette smoking a lot of people say that relaxes them however it's the double-edged sword because it robs your body of oxygen and again Mm -hmm. will create more anxiety and Mm -hmm. more stress to the body right so really think about how you're treating your body i mean this is this is your castle we we just get the one you know this is it (laughs) um and i liken it to a car i mean you want to um you want to feed all areas so if you've got a lopsided vehicle you know if the tires aren't all pumped up and so the tire is the physical tire, the spiritual one the emotional one and the mental one you want to keep that kind of balance And addition to substances, one of the most important things is uh, sleep. Mm -hmm. And um, that's one thing, again, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I'm a therapist that talks about, (laughs) are you drinking enough water? Are you getting enough sleep? Because um, CJ, honestly, if we miss uh, either two to three nights of sleep, if we're not sleeping, our mental health is pretty much, uh, I want to say destroyed. I know that sounds very severe, however it is. And mm. um, I, your anxiety levels, you won't have the resilience, you won't have that strength mm. to, to cope. And of course, anxiety, uh, you're going to feel a lot of anxiety. So one of the things you really want to get in order is get good sleep. Mm. And that is so important. And um, really, uh, yeah, that that's got to be your priority if you're not sleeping. And you know, what's so amazing is um, I work with people, of course, and, and getting them to sleep and having good sleep. They've, they're changed. They come in and they just feel fantastic. So mm. um, it makes such a huge difference. Um, yeah, who need our sleep and we need it for so many reasons. And you know, you've brought up uh, 2020 and what's going on in our world. Well, our best defense is to be well rested. It's, it's our best defense to be healthy, to make good decisions, to think well. We need that sleep. It's, mm. it's our time to rejuve. So mm. um, I, I, I obviously I'm passionate about it. <laughs> <laughs> I totally get it. And I completely agree. And my kids, I'm going to play this over and over for them. <laughs> I keep on saying like sleep is so important. Okay. So, um, so um, I, I don't know if you had another strategy, but um, should we move on to a agoraphobia sure let's let's finish these up the different types of anxiety so agoraphobia is and we've talked i think people um have heard that uh, a lot is um and it's more common in adults uh where uh they do not want to uh leave their home or perhaps their room Mm -hmm. and again it's um a type of anxiety um uh, a lot of it is um, they're worried that they're going to have a panic attack in public mm. um, or they're worried that uh, people are judging them. And so, um, you know, maybe they're maybe you're shy or maybe you feel awkward. Um, so then there's that tension of um, of leaving uh, something that's safe and um, and holding you hostage and uh You know, if that is the case, then you probably want to seek out some therapy um, and um, perhaps talk to some people. You can try certain strategies that may help. 
but uh, probably therapy would be good. Um, the other one is phobia. Wait, wait, can I just go back? What are some strat strategies that for agoraphobia? Because the whole shy and awkward thing is really a thing, you know, where if you, Sorry. The, the whole idea of like, you know, a lot of people haven't even been out and seeing people in COVID. And I've noticed the friends of mine who are more introverted and don't go out. It's almost like they have a hard time, like, you know, getting out there. Um, and because like, what will, you know, will people judge me? I haven't really been doing much work because I'm out unemployed. Will they judge me? Will they're going to ask me, how am I going, how am I doing and ask about my work? I don't really want to answer that. So um, how to deal with, I mean, aside from, we've talked about a lot of great strategies already coming up with the checklist, getting aware of what's prob what problematic, measuring it from a scale to zero to 10 to see if it's something you have to address. Um, we talked about some other different kinds of, you know, checking some, uh, we've, we've talked about so many different things, calming, centering, buddy system, all these kind of things. What else haven't we talked about would you recommend for, for this being shy, awkward, you know, I, I just don't even want to leave the house. Well, here's the thing, which is interesting because there's um, perhaps um, uh, the person uh, you may find that you were already agoraphobic before 2020. Um, if it's because of what's just happened, I mean, I think there are two different answers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, people are definitely stressed and tense. Uh, we're getting a lot of mixed information and messages. Um, so it's very stressful. And so again, you know, if it's because of this nervousness of what's going on in the world is, you know, perhaps try and find uh, friends or family that are uh, sympathetic, not argumentative, like, uh, we don't want to argue about concepts or, or politics or anything like that, but perhaps sympathetic in, um, you know, uh, how can we connect? And um, yeah, and, and uh, we're meant to be uh, together as humans. We're meant to um, look at each other. We're meant to smile at each other. We're meant to touch each other. And when that's that that's been taken away, it it does really it really messes us up. But that's yeah. that's not a medical term. It's just, <laughs> it, but it does really make a mess of things. And and I have to tell you, as a therapist, um, I really shook my head and um, with all these um, lockdowns and isolation. And um, it's you know. Um, Anyways, I don't want to get into yeah, no, but details of it because that's not what this is about. But what I did know, and uh, I've seen it, and it's actually um, unfortunately getting worse, is that people are breaking down. And, and so, you know, I want to encourage everybody to do uh, what you can. So if it means having eye contact, if it means getting outside, if it means going for a walk with somebody, you can do a lot of these things that are comfortable. And obviously I don't wanna ever ask anybody to do something that's not comfortable. And, um, you know, really trust your body because um, we need, we, we are tribe animals. We're meant to be in groups and uh, we're not meant to be isolated. And uh, so how can you, do this you know how can you do this and feel comfortable and right. you know there's so many ways of doing this well i think the um, way the thing that you said earlier where there's a balance between your mental health and your physical health right, right. and and you're so like okay yeah maybe you're putting yourself at risk for covid but you're also putting your mental health at risk too so it's balancing what you need yeah and here's the thing and you're right about that balance like um and, and every situation is different. And, and I have to appreciate that. Um, you know, uh, where we're living is all different. And, um, you know, we can still go outside. Um, I mean, think about really maybe do your research and um, what makes it healthy for you. And, um, and again, you know, that balance, like for me, um, 
I know that if I have, well, let's put it this way. As I have good mental health, my immune system is kick-ass. <laughs> mm, yes, exactly. Um, um, and, I, and I sleep better and I, I have really good sleep hygiene. So, you know, I watch some fun movies. I'm not on my social media. I'm watching something inspirational. So when I go to bed and I've got my daily practice, I'm already feeling very content mm. and happy and it's important. And it, and it doesn't um, negate what's happening out out there but i always think about you know prior to social media prior to 2020 you know what were we doing to take care of ourselves mm. we need to we got to remember these things and how important this is to us and so that's a bit different than uh, agoraphobia that's a very situational i think um a situation that has been created and so, um, you know, how do we um, get and, and be healthy? And, and there's many, many different ways of doing that, um, that are, and I, I want to dare say the word safe, but it's got to be comfortable, right? But so let's actually go back to the traditional way of how you're afraid that other people are going to judge you. Right. What, what are, what are ways to work with your mind or otherwise to kind of well, the Get around uh, agoraphobia, I want, I'm going to defer a little bit because um, usually, and I, uh, I know we probably have listeners that are, is um, really do seek out a coach or a therapist to help because some of that, if that was happening before 2020, and I'm, I'm sure it was exasperated last year, but um it may need some professional help. It may come from um, some other reason or worry or trauma. Um, and, um, and I have worked with people that are um, agoraphobic. And um, I guess one thing is you can get over it. Um, it is about small steps. And, um, you know, maybe it's about doing something that's comfortable for you. Maybe it's about sitting on your French porch and just having a, um, a cup of a cuppa um, right. you know, to get outside. Maybe it's just about to go and get the mail and then come home again, um, you know, small steps. And, um, but I would actually really encourage professional help. Right, yeah, so, uh, and what you mean by trauma is like, so it could be that, you know, you had a teacher that said, you're never, you're awful at talking in front of other people. And so you're traumatized. And then like anytime you try to talk in front of someone at a party, you're like instantly in this phobic situation. So you need to talk to a therapist, a coach or whomever in order right. to dissect like, where is this from? Because it's probably from some one of your previous experiences. And so once you heal that, it's gonna be, you'll walk into that same scenario with a different relationship with the whole scenario. So I, is that what you meant by seeing a therapist yes, or coach? And, okay. and, and, that, and, and that therapist or coach will help you gain confidence. And that's what uh, uh, I think a lot of it is, um, is gaining confidence and knowing that you're, you're okay, confidence and knowing that you can actually do this, confidence and knowing that you can, um, you can go home again, or you can nav get, navigate what's right for you. So yeah, that's, that's important. Great. Love that. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Got it. And then um, phobias, we talked about like spiders and yeah. water yeah. And, and such like that. But I think that those are specific things that you're afraid of. Um, right. And again, if, um, if they control your life, like if they don't control your life, then why are we worrying about it? And that's with any of these. Mm -hmm. If, if you feel that you're totally content with how you're living and you're, you're healthy, you're happy, then I'd say, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. You know? So if you're a hermit, and you're happy with where you live and how you're living and, and you feel good and you're not hurting anybody and you're not hurting yourself, then, then it's a problem. Can't... Well, exactly. <laughs> why can't that be okay? I mean, it's okay, right? If you're happy. So, so just these things that, that we talk about is really only if it's, it's hurting you or if it's stopping you and, and uh, 
I love that. <laughs> She's like, don't worry about it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't worry about the phobia because that in itself is another thing you have to worry about. Well, exactly. <laughs> and if it doesn't bother you, it's, I think it's okay. Yeah, Why can't it be okay? If, if you're afraid of chickens, of live chickens, I want to use that one is um then stay away from live chickens it, it, <laughs> exactly. and, yeah and there's so much you can do in your life and your world to thrive that you don't have to be around chickens. yeah don't worry about it okay exactly. so i want to talk about <laughs> <laughs> so post-traumatic stress disorder which most yeah. people know are familiar with like that's if you go to war and you know you're shell shocked from when you hear you know guns firing but it can be more than that right Right. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's very interesting. Actually, I, I do work with a lot of first responders. And, um, and I also work with uh, people that have been traumatized. And so post traumatic stress can come in uh, various ways. And um, it's interesting, too, because a lot of my first responders, um, it's their last resort to come to therapy. <laughs> Um, they feel, and it's unfortunate. And if you're out there and you feel like you've, you know, we, we talk about the very traditional flashbacks, triggers, uh, nightmares, but it doesn't always, uh, isn't always like that. It can be, um, you know, hypervigilance, mm. it could be, um, irritability. Um, it could be having that bad temper, um, and uncontrollable, uh, rage, um, so, so it could also be, uh, very intense anxiety. It could even show up as a panic attack. So it's very interesting mm -hmm. how some of these, you know, you might say, well, I have panic attacks, but I don't necessarily think I have post-traumatic stress, but, but that's where you want to unpack that. And, and post-traumatic stress doesn't always have to come from something catastrophic. So catastrophic is like what you mentioned, you know, war, catastrophic could be a fire a death a bad accident um, that's catastrophic it also we call it small t's so it could be you know maybe you fell off your bike and and you mentioned one where somebody told you you were a terrible person and and you heard that as a child well your brain maybe grabbed that and kept it mm. um, and that doesn't mean that your brain is wrong or bad or anything like that and um, so we can sometimes, um, get these, um, small T's or maybe it's an accumulation, uh, maybe, um, you know, some therapists get it, or maybe, um, interviewers, <laughs> if they hear terrible stories over and over again, we can get, it's called secondary trauma or visceral trauma. Oh. Um, so we need to just be aware and again, um, you know, even if you suspect it, just please know it's not something that um, has to be a, a terrible thing. It's something that, um, you know, you can learn to cope with and, and uh, heal from. And so our brain, um, the brain has had an injury in this case, and um, it's about healing the brain. So mm -hmm. if you can look at it that way, I mean, you know, you know, if we break an arm or we hurt our back or we have stomach ulcers or, or whatever, um, you know, we, we need to heal those things. And, and when we have a brain injury, um, sometimes uh, we think that something is wrong with us. And, um, you know, it, it, sometimes it takes a therapist to, to show you or teach you that your brain has gotten hurt and um, we've got to help the brain heal. And that is possible. So, um, so I, I have a question that related right now. Um, as we speak, George Floyd in the United States, I know you're from Canada, but um, he's he's going through, there's a trial of the police officer that had his knee on the gentleman's yes, neck. Yes, I, I'm then, familiar with it, yes. Okay, and then recently in, in the U.S., um, there was a woman who pulled out what she thought was a taser by accident and killed uh, an African-American guy, white young man, right as this was the trial was going on. So um, is that secondary trauma? So you're, let's say that um, I, I watched it and I felt traumatized and I'm not even uh, African-American man. So right. is that what secondary trauma is? Yeah, and that's a really great question. Um, because so here I, I would like to um, define how the brain uh, processes trauma. 
So right. yes, you can get traumatized by watching something on TV. You can get traumatized by hearing about these stories. So, but here's the thing is your brain is um, already has the capacity to process trauma. So, so let's say, um, you know, you watch this and yes, it's horrible. And, um, and then maybe had some dreams about it, but then in a couple of weeks, um, you're not thinking about it as much. It's not as invasive. That means your brain is dealing with that trauma. So, mm. um, but here's another case. So I hope, I hope that's clear. Yes. So your brain and, right. and this is actually also for people that have had um, catastrophic accidents. Sometimes the brain, and it just depends on the circumstance, um, and that can be for another show, but <laughs> right. um, the brain can process it. And so um, it, you naturally may get over that. So we do watch people that have had catastrophic um, um, events. And uh, in uh, a lot of cases, they are processing it as our first responders. A lot of them do process most of uh, the cases. Now, here's another thing is, let's say, um, CJ, you watched uh, that particular um, event and got traumatized by it. And then, you know, then another one happened and then you watched another one and another one. And then by the second week, you're not sleeping anymore. You're having invasive thoughts. Right. Like if I were an African-American man, I probably would not be sleeping. I'm, I'm guessing like if I've had probably experienced a series of traumas up until that point, then I see, you know, George Floyd and like the case that they're trying to build around what happened and then this, like, so it, I, I assume, so not sleeping. I mean, is that part of what you're talking about? Is that secondary yes. trauma? So, okay. if it's, so, so here's the thing, if it doesn't go away, you know, if you find that, you know, in a few weeks time, you're still getting these intense um, uh, flashbacks, you're, you're still having nightmares, you're, you're finding that you're irritable, you're not sleeping well, it's possible that, um, you haven't processed the, the secondary trauma. Mm. And here's an interesting thing, and um, I don't want to alarm our listeners or watchers, but uh, wives, children of any of our first responders, a lot of them do have, or it's possible that they do have this secondary trauma as well, because, you know, they're, they're always on guard. They're always watching, worrying, mm. you know, is dad going to come home? Is mom going to come home? Um, and they're picking up on um, that energy. Mm. And um, so, yeah, I, I know I've sometimes worked with family. So just being aware of those things, um, and knowing that, uh, you know, the brain is equipped to process it. It's just that if there's a pileup, <laughs> and that's what well, I call it, you know, there, this pileup in the front cortex where it's not getting filed. And um, then we do need to look at it. And, and you, you do want to seek professional help for that, for sure. Well, I, it's interesting. So for when, when those six women in Atlanta got shot, what happened for me, I was like literally in shock. And I was like, wow, I'm in shock, but it didn't even happen to me. What's happening? And I realized that it was, I don't know if it was secondary trauma, but what had happened was everything that had not been processed in my brain previously for all the different times where I experienced prejudice against being an Asian, they all kind of came rushing back at yeah. that one instance. So is that pretty typical that you any unhealed stuff is pi I'm using that example that you said is piled up. And so your brain is like, okay, I've had it done. Yep. You yep. got to go figure this out. Yeah. Because what, what happens, happens and, uh, and you've uh, touched on a really good one uh, again is uh, social and cultural beliefs. And so what happens is we're collecting beliefs, especially from six and under. And um, we're not, we don't have any filters for that. And then, of course, we still collect beliefs as we grow and we get those. Um, now, here's one. We blame our parents <laughs> for right. a lot of these things. But of course, you know, I just want to want to say that we don't need to. We we get them from our parents. We get them from our whole tribe again. So we're getting them from our teachers, from our storekeepers, 
from, um, you know, uh, TV, we're getting them from our neighbors, like we're picking up social beliefs. And as little children, we don't have filters. So we take these mm. beliefs in as truisms. And then, you know, as we grow, um, and we have these experiences, and maybe we've had some uh, trauma experiences, and if they haven't processed, and if they're, what I say, locked into a belief, then yes, uh, something like this event um, would definitely trigger us. And then, boom, you know, we're, we've got this like, whoa, what is happening to me? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that, that may take some unpacking to do. Uh, so, again, it's manageable. And um, perhaps um, something that you want to talk to a coach or a therapist with. Yeah. So, if this is all happening during the, this Black Life Matters and all the kind of things that are happening in the United States, don't be surprised if, in fact, you feel overwhelmed because you may have hit that that point in which your brain can no longer kind of process all of it right you call it the backfill yeah. of stuff yeah yeah and you know and this is this is such a like I'm really really want to put out there the compassion for this type of pain because it mm -hmm. is painful and um you know uh, we want to be going to healthy strategies um we want to feel better so it's not wrong to feel better They'll really uh, consider what those strategies may be. And, um, you know, I would implore that you could reach out to somebody, um, talk to someone, don't be alone, um, and try and talk it out for starters and um, to get some support. Because, um, you know, um, you know we, we can go into uh, some not so good strategies and then we end up hurting ourselves and the people around us that we love. So, um really try and reach out if you yeah can. um all right and we we are have gotten to obsessive compulsive disorder so what is yes. what's that well ocd we talk about it a lot i think a lot of people we joke about it um um and and most of us really don't have ocd but we may you know if if you would watch me and i'm straightening things out or or um you know, a, a fun one is straightening out the towels in the, in the bathroom, just so, or having things just so right. uh, we may tease our, our loved ones and say, oh, you have OCD, or we may say that to ourselves. Um, but that's not really what it is. So um, it is an obsession. So it could be obsession with thoughts so that um, we have certain thought patterns um, we're obsessed with um, the other, and it's usually negative or fearful. Um, the other one is uh, compulsions, so compulsions behaviorally. Um, and again, it's not about straightening those towels or lining up the pencils or straightening out the shoes in the front hallway. If, you know, that's, that's okay. But I know we, we tend to loosely talk about that. But the behavioral thing is, you know, maybe I've got to turn the lights on and off 10 times in every room. Maybe I've got to turn the doorknobs. Maybe I have to go around and check everything. Maybe I have to, you know, it, there's this ritual that starts to take over. And, um, and we have this sense of that we can't um, function or go out or do the next task without the ritual. Oh. And, um, and sometimes these rituals, again, uh, you know, if they're a minor thing, um, like, um, you know, I'm going to go back to the towels because uh, my friend, she calls herself OCD because she has to do this, but it's not, it, that's okay. It's not, that's, it's not hurting anybody. It's, you know, she, she doesn't yell at anybody for it. She just does it because it pleases her. That's different. But if it starts to hurt you and starts to stop you from your life, then you want to mm. deal with it. Um, the other thing too is, um, and we didn't, we touched on this a little bit, but um, OCD can be inherited. Mm. So that's interesting. So if uh, it's possible that, um, you know, if you have somebody in your family, immediate family, like uh, a sibling or perhaps a parent, it's possible you can inherit that. And the same as anxiety um, is, you know, if you have a parent that's uh, very anxious, it's possible as a child 
that you could in, inherit it and uh, by being around it, not so much that it's part of you, but um, it's a possibility. So, um, you know, you might be scratching your head and going, well, I'm, I'm good. My life is good, but why am I like this? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, it could be that um, you've learned it. And then, and again, the good news is that you can unlearn it. And with um, OCD, depending on, you know, what you do, um, part of OCD is also uh, hoarding uh, that comes Mm. kind of with that too. Mm -hmm. Um, That takes, again, professional, um, some help, and it's all in small steps. So Mm. um, knowing that you can do this. Now, with some strategies that I've heard in the past are kind of like, you have your key, like, um, it's kind of like, you have your keys. It's okay. You're safe. I'm turning the doorknob now. So you kind of do an an out loud narrative so that you tell your brain, I've locked the door and I don't have to come back. Um, I mean, are there other kind of strategies that people can try? Well, I'm not sure. Um, I actually, um, I'm going to share just one for me that I had. I, um, I had, I was in a house fire when I was eight and um, it it was pretty traumatic for me. And uh, then again, uh, so anytime, and I didn't realize that um, this was a trauma, (laughs) Um, but what I did notice as an adult is anytime um, there was talk about a fire, perhaps fire on TV or in the news, I would break down. I was a mess. Mm. And then in my 20s, um, I had another house fire. It wasn't the house. Oh, no. the barn. Right. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I developed uh, some habits of, that I had to go around and check several times. Everything was shut off. Everything mm. was, um, you know, the stove, the whatever. And, um, and then what I realized is that I had to do some work around it. So I did. And it was interesting, too, because um, I have <laughs> I always talk about chickens because I've had chickens. So I had electricity out to my chicken coop and I always had nightmares about them. Uh, so then, you know, what is, and, and then um, being obsessive about checking, right? So it's, it's um, balancing the safety and then also about what is the obsession. And so, um, mm. you know, I went, I mean, even as a therapist, I went and went, okay, I got to deal with this because this is not fun because I would drive out of the driveway and have to come back and go, I'm not sure. And I just did it. Um, you know, it's like, I have to go check the stove. I, I think I left the stove on. So it's um, so, you know, there's that safety aspect and then there's also that obsessive aspect. So um, anyways, in that particular case, I had left the stove on. So I had wow. a car and I did go back. So So it's really, you know, doing the work, um, recognizing um, these uh, fears and this unpleasantness. Mm. um, And um, it usually doesn't feel good, but I have to tell you, it felt good to turn the stove off. (laughs) You're like, I did know that I didn't turn it off. Yeah, so that was a good thing. And and I also have a wood stove. So yes. Oh, wow. I'm very careful with that and I check it, you know, I'm always checking it and, and that's not a bad thing. And I've recognized that, that that's not a bad thing. So it's again, coming back to yourself, being aware of, you know, your own body, what's okay with yourself. And, um, you know, if it's like, I'm at a point now, um, you know, that uh, I understand what that is. However, I'm not feeling that um, intrusive unpleasantness anymore. So then, you know, then it goes into caretaking, right? As right. in balance. Yeah, this has been so fabulous. We um, have been talking to Elka Scholes about her book, Anxiety Warrior, and we've had a really beautiful walkthrough of a lot of the different strategies. Um, I understand a great deal more about these different ways in which anxiety can show up all the different flavors of anxiety. Um, Thank you so much. So interesting. My pleasure. Thank you.